Well, speaking of obedience, uh, I can't get away from a, me a message that I've been trying to kind of get away from because I don't know why in the world I would, I would, he would have me deliver this message to the people that are the most faithful, you know. Uh, again, you're the, you're the uh, tip of the spear, in my opinion, the ones that I see here when it's time to pray. And uh, we're going to talk about obedience, I guess. I don't know exactly the title yet. Um, turn to Revelations uh, chapter 2. And the church at Thyatira. So Revelations 2.18, where we're going to go first. Along with this revival, and Dave would say this often, he says, when the power goes up, so does judgment. It's a two-edged, it's a two-sided coin. And you can't really have one without the other. And God is long-suffering and merciful, and he's trying to rescue a people, and trying to rescue nations and people in many nations, I think. But as the power turns up, so does the power in the judgment side. And again, Dave did a masterful job teaching about Ananias and Sapphira. And uh, but really, their sin compared to how we normally think about sin is fairly small. They lied about an offering. It's just, if you're going to put it in one sentence, they lied about an offering. And they fell dead in judgment. Dear Lord, <laughs> if we had that level of judgment in America today, you'd hear thuds and pulpits all across the land because the lying when it comes to offerings. But still, that doesn't, that's kind of humorous, but it uh, makes you wonder what's coming, you know. But God is merciful, and He does give space to repent. And uh, He gave me space to repent, which I'll get to in a minute. But let's just look here at Thyatira for a moment, because this is one of the most heinous sins here, and still the Lord gave space to repent. So Revelations 2.18, And unto the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These things saith the Son of God, who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. I know thy works, and charity, and service, and faith, and thy patience, and thy works, and the last to be more than the first. Now, doesn't this sound like a good church? It does. I know thy works, your, your charity, that's they helping the poor and things, your service, your faith, your patience, your works, and they're doing more now than they did in the beginning. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee. Because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calls herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. Now, obviously, this is not the same woman, Jezebel, that we saw in the Old Testament. So this is a reference to the same spirit that's controlling her. Uh, I mean, Jezebel in the Old Testament had the prophets of God just killed by the hundreds. And there was a certain man that hid, I can't remember now if it was 50 or 100 of them in a cave, or there wouldn't have been any prophets of God left. And uh, Jezebel, she was absolutely, Bel is part of her name. Her father was a king, and uh, they worshiped Baal there. And even in her name, Bel is a reference back to Baal. I've been, I've been doing some study on that, but not, it's still in the oven, not ready yet. Okay. But here's a church that, on the, you start off, you go, my goodness, this, this church, Jesus commends it. I know thy works. They're given to the poor. They're doing all, they have faith. They, they're standing patiently. They have works, and they're not fading out. They're doing better than they did in the beginning. You'd think that's a good church. But this church also allowed whoever this person is to teach the same false doctrine that that original Jezebel was putting out. To commit his servants. Notice, to teach and to seduce my 
servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. I believe that's just a reference in the modern day. It would be pornography and all kinds of things that you're involved in. <clears throat> now look at verse 21. This is just you talk about the mercy of God. And I gave her space to repent of her fornication. And she repented not. Now, <clears throat> the Lord always gives space to repent. I remember after praying, uh, I can't remember now how many months, the Lord called me full time into the ministry. I was still driving the trucks, but I've been praying. It was over a year. And he called me to go full time in the ministry. I was clear as a bell. I knew exactly what he said. I can still quote it today. But I did not obey him. And it was just plain fear because I didn't know him very well. I didn't know him as really as father, as provider. And so I didn't know. I just didn't obey him. Thank God he gave me space to repent. I know when that was. That was in February of 1994. <laughs> when he called me. And, uh, but I didn't do it. I didn't even tell Sue what happened. Because I knew Sue would tell me to obey God. <laughs> you know? and, well, it's truth, you know. And he gave me, let's talk about space to repent. Because I had from February, whatever day it was in February till December 4th. And how I know it was December 5th is our anniversary. And it, this happened the day before our anniversary. So he gave me a long time. Could you call that space to repent? He was very kind to me during that time. I continued to pray. He continued to bring revelation knowledge. I have volumes of things that I wrote during that time period of disobedience. He was kind and good to me. I would call it space to repent. And the Lord himself now didn't do anything to me the way I describe it. Because what you, most of you know what happened. On December 4th, I had a heart situation happened. It was the last day. I never drove another truck after that. Blacked out I'm in the hospital, come within a breath or two of leaving the planet. And I had a marvelous thought that I told Sue. I said, I believe it's going to be in my best interest to obey God. You know, and that's when I told her the whole, the whole thing. And I was scared. I was just scared, you know. I said, I, I, don't know what, I don't know if I'm hearing him for sure. I don't know. What if we want, I have visions of us living under a bridge and wearing gunny sacks, you know. And I've told you the story. I got me a wife now. Cause she said, well, I don't either. I don't know either. I don't know whether you're hearing God or not. She didn't really say it that way. But her attitude was, if we wind up under a bridge wearing gunny sacks, I'm with you. I want you to obey God. Now, it wasn't God that did anything to me. I'm really convinced of that. See, safety for any sheep is to stay up close to where the shepherd is leaving. And the shepherd carries a, a staff, a rod, and he also carries that shepherd's crook that has the hook on the end of it. <coughs> well, the crook, the, the thing with the hook on it is if the sheep starts wandering off, he'll gently try and put that around your neck and get you back on the path. But the staff is for the wolf. The shepherd's job, just like David, is to keep the wolf away. But if the shepherd says, follow me, let's go this way. But the rebellious Gary sheep says, I'm going to go that way. <laughs> eventually, the way I see it now, I got myself out beyond staff length. I eventually got out there on the devil's ground and I got attacked by the wolf. And I nearly took me off the planet. Now, <clears throat> I was afraid to obey God. But let me ask you this question at the beginning. Where was safety? Where was really the safest place for me to be? The safest place was to obey God. I don't care that it was scary. I don't care that I didn't understand what was going to happen. It, I don't, uh, we didn't know where, our, where food would come from. We didn't know where income. We didn't know anything. But as I look back on it now, for sure, safety was to obey. There's more safety in obeying than there is in disobeying. While we're on that topic, I'll come back here, hopefully, to Revelations in a minute. Just think about the prophet Jonah. He had exactly, he knew exactly what to do. 
Yet 40, he knew what his message was. I mean, I can memorize that message, you know. Yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be destroyed. There it is. That's your message, you know. But he didn't want to obey God. And he ran from God hard. Sounds like Gary. <laughs> well, things didn't go so well with him either, you know. Every, he, further he tried to get away from God, the worse things got. And finally he was on a ship and the ship was about to sink. And he had to finally confess to him. He says, I'm the, I'm the problem. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm running from God. I'm disobeying God. And they said, okay, fine. Thanks for letting us know. Overboard he went. <laughs> Where was safety, you guys, for Jonah? Stay with the will of God. That's where safety is. And he found out, and sure enough, he got swallowed by the whale, and God still wasn't done, you know, and brought him up to the shore, spit him out. I often wonder if he was an albino after the digestive juices. Can you imagine, you know, you're in Nineveh, and this bleached white person <laughs> who smells like a whale's belly <laughs> comes out and goes, repent. <laughs> I think I'd repent, too. <laughs> It's scary it to pieces. <laughs> and the amazing thing is, Nineveh did repent. And at the time, now I've done a little, I've been doing a little research on that. Nineveh was the capital of Assyria. Assyria, at that moment, was so powerful, they had conquered Egypt. Egypt was under Assyrian rule. How strong is that? Yet they were going, the sin was terrible in Nineveh. But they actually repented, and God had mercy on them, spared the judgment, and that made no, Jonah even matter. He says, I knew you'd do that. I knew I'd go and say that, and then you'd, you'd have mercy on them. I, you know, but anyway. Now, I'm going to, this is a bonus, because, and I think I've mentioned it once already, see. We all know that story so well, because we've been taught Jonah from the time we were little. There's an also another prophet in the Old Testament called Nahum, N-A-H-U-M. I did not realize until very recently, Nahum was also a prophet to Nineveh. And Nahum was 130-ish years later. And what happened, even though Nineveh repented and God had mercy on them, over that 130 years or so, they backslid right back in to the same apostasy they were doing before. With Nahum, if you read his little short book, Prophet, there is no space to repent in Nahum. Strictly judgment. And that, can't, that by the way, that was the end of the Assyrian Empire. Hmm. See, a space to repent does not mean forever. Now we're back to Revelations. <clears throat> I gave her space, verse 21, I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. Now, we're not told how long that space was. For Nineveh, it was a little over 100 years. Um, I don't know how long it was with this. But look at verse 22. You can tell that space to repent doesn't mean forever. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they what? Except they repent of their deeds. And I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he which searches the reins and hearts. And I will give unto every one of you according to your works. But I say unto you and unto the rest in Thyatira, as many as have not this doctrine. See, you can tell he's talking about doctrine. The doctrine there was you can be a servant of God and still commit fornication. You can be a servant of God and still partake with Doctrines of devils, you know, eating meat, sacrificed to them. But he says, as many as have not that doctrine, and which have not known the depths of Satan as they speak, I will put upon you none other burden. But that which you have already, hold fast till I come. And he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations." And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, as the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I received of my father, and I will give him the morning star. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. So would it have been better for these followers of Jezebel here? What, where is safety for them? Repent. Repent. And, and follow the Lord and obey the Lord. This only real safety is, is, in, is in obeying the Lord. 
So we looked at that with Jonah. Let's look at another one with Esther. Esther it was, it lived in a very difficult time. And there was a plot to exterminate the Jews. It's like a prelude to Hitler. And they, I mean extinct, make them extinct. And Esther, as you know, had become uh, the queen of the king. And I believe it's her uncle. He kept pressuring her, saying, you need to go talk to the king and let him know about this conspiracy. Let him know what's going on. Well, the thing of it is that to, to go into the king without being invited could be very often a death sentence. Even if you were the queen, it didn't matter. And she's afraid to do that. And you know the famous line, who knows but that you were born for such a time as this. I'm paraphrasing. You may choose not to do this, but if you do, God will raise up another way to save the Jews. But if you don't do it, there's no guarantee that you yourself are going to be okay. So she gathered up her courage, and she went into the king, and he gave her permission to speak. And as you know, the rest of the story, the Jews were saved, and the plotters that were going to kill the Jews were killed. So now in Esther's case, what if she would have played it safe and not opened her mouth? Where is safety? It was fearful to obey the Lord. But that was the place of safety. To do what she was born for such a time as that. It was her job to speak up. It was her job to obey the Lord. Born for such a time as this. We are much in a similar situation today, by the way. So now, the point, I think, of tonight's message is, uh, this morning he was going through very meticulously some of the instructions that we have in this season. And he knows that we've been at this a while now. You can tell from the thinning of the crowd, a lot of people have given up hope. How can you say that? Well, they're not here. Come on. You do what you believe. You know, you do what you believe in. If you really think it'll make a difference, you'll be there. And if you've lost hope, you won't be. And I hate to be so blunt, but that's just the truth. You are what you do. Because there's people not here tonight that normally would be here. I'm not talking about that. But you know and I know there's many people that just habitually do not come to this service. Well, that's their choice. We're not under a dictatorship or anything here. And there's always occasion. I've had to miss them. I've been out of town or other reasons, you know. But the truth of the matter is you are what you do. What you really believe, you're going to do that. See? So if you habitually don't come, it's because you don't think anything's going to happen. Or you don't think it's really involved in producing revival. That's just, if that's the way it is, that's the way it is. Our job is to keep pressing on, just like anything else, until we can demonstrate the power of God, and then people will change their mind. So that's all I've got to say about that. But there's, there's legitimate reasons to be away. People that very often are here are not here tonight. Well, I know if I talk with them, they've got a graduation going on or something going on. And uh, so, you know, I don't mean that like you never miss, but if you habitually don't come, well, that's because you don't believe anything's going to happen. And you don't believe it's really instrumental in producing revival. Either that or it's worse. You just don't care. <laughs> I always look at B because she's the most faithful person that I know. And she knows I'm not talking about her. <laughs> I always feel guilty if I'm here five minutes late and B's already there. Man. <clears throat> and... Uh, Nobody likes it when your congregation walks out. I'm sure, I wonder what Jesus felt like that day that at least 70 walked out. We know at least 70 walked out. Could have been a lot more than that. Could have been thousands walked out. And it says they followed him no more either. They weren't at the next meeting either. <laughs> Nobody likes that, but he is my pattern. And just like he said in that prophecy, Jesus didn't go running after him. He didn't, and he didn't come follow it. Now, wait a minute, you, don't, you misunderstood what I was saying. Let me explain it to you. He didn't do any of that. You don't want to hear the words of life? There's the door. 
When I think of the thousands, when you go through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and you look at the thousands that were healed under his ministry, thousands upon thousands, and how many were there on that day when he gave the instruction, don't leave Jerusalem until you be endued with power? Who knows how many? But how many were in the upper room? A hundred and twenty only were in the upper room. It just astounds me. Out of the thousands upon thousands that he healed. The 120. And God knew that from the beginning. You can go back to the Old Testament when they were dedicating Solomon's temple. How many trumpeters were there that day, y'all? 120 trumpeters, which is a type and shadow of the speaking in tongues. God knew even then how many there was going to be. God does know the end from the beginning, and I'm really glad about that. But now the point of this service, and especially to the tip of the spear, the massive crowd we have here tonight, <laughs> okay, he's going to do it this way. How important is it that one obey him? See, we talked about Esther. One. We talked about Jonah. One. Let's talk about a different Ananias. That after Paul had seen Jesus on the road to Damascus and he had been blinded and led into Samaria, uh, led into Damascus, and God appears to a disciple, and it's amazing how it's worded. It just says a disciple, not Bishop Ananias, not Reverend Ananias, not Pastor Ananias, just disciple. So I like to say blue collar, Joe everybody, Ananias. And he asked him to do something that was scary. I want you to go to a certain, you know, he gives the house, and the name of the house and the street and so forth. There's a man there named Saul. He's seen a man named Ananias coming in in a vision, laying hands and so forth. And Ananias realizes who it is that God's talking about. And it scares him. And I, when I teach this, I have to add a little inflection. Like, <clears throat> Lord, <laughs> do you know who that is? Do you know what horrible things he has done? He arrests people. He has letters of authority. He takes them back to Jerusalem, and they get imprisoned, and some have been killed. Like, have you, Did you hear about Stephen? <laughs> I'm, I'm adding a little bit anyway. It was scary. I think about Ananias, if he was... You know, I had a normal brain. Same way when the Lord called me to go full-time, my natural mind, the one that Alan was talking about this morning, the, the natural part of us. Man, it was going through all the analytics. I got a car payment. I got, a, I got rent to pay. I've got, what do you mean? What Follow you into ministry? What ministry? We have no ministry. You do know nobody's calling, asking us to preach anywhere. You know, what? And... <laughs> You know, my wife has this eating problem. Lord, my wife wants to eat every day. And most days, more than once. <laughs> now I'm making that up. But, <laughs> but I really was not making it up. Those, how are we going to eat, is exactly, I'm the opposite of Matthew 6. Everything he said in Matthew 6, don't do, I'm doing all that. What are we going to eat? What are we going to wear? What are we going to drink? How are we going to pay our rent? On and on and on and on. And on. Well, Ananias goes, Lord, are you sure? This guy, he kills guys like me. <laughs> he, he kills Christians. Are you sure, Lord? It's scary. So the Lord, what I love about the Lord, the Lord answered him back and helped relieve his fears. He says, no, you, you do what I told you. I'm going to show him how much he's going to wind up suffering for, for my name's sake. How important is it for one person to be obedient? How important was it for Ananias to go? Scary, dangerous. He had to be thinking like we think. Am I really hearing God? Can this be God? What if I'm missing it? What if that's a devil? What if that's just me? What if this is a trap by the enemy trying to get me killed? You know? But how important is it that one man obeyed God? laid hands on Saul, get him filled with the Holy Ghost. 
where the blinders come off his eyes and he can see. It winds up being the Apostle Paul. Don't you know a lot of what Paul did is on Ananias' account? It has to be. It has to be. You never know the long range importance of things that the Holy Ghost will ask you to do. You know, I want you to go pray and lay hands on this person. And that person turns out to be the next Billy Graham or the next Smith Wigglesworth. You never know. So with tonight's message, yes, sir. Okay, I'll do it this way. Sue was asking me to explain a statement I made today, and I, I will go a little bit farther into it. This is what I meant. Because I said, I, I can see I've got to make some changes after, after I heard the bicycle story. I hope, is anyone not here this morning? Anyone not hear that story? If you're watching and you didn't hear this morning's service, just hear this morning's service. But a guy's, his brother's bicycle got stolen. It was his fault. He felt responsible. He was accusing the Lord, going, okay, I'm going to remind you every day that you're powerless to do anything about this. The bicycle is stolen. It's gone. We'll never see it again. I'm going to remind you every day, every day, every day, every day, how powerless you are to do anything about it. Whew. I don't know that I have that much <laughs> moxie yet. But anyway, the Lord started giving him instructions, and I, it's amazing that he obeyed. Told him to go to the same place where it was stolen. Sure enough, here in a little while, a young man rides up on a bike, but it's a different color. Doesn't look like the same bike, you know. The guy goes in the, the store, and the Lord says, get on that bike and pedal it away as fast as you can. Now, that sounds like, see, if I'd have heard that, I would not have obeyed that. This is what I was talking about. I would not have obeyed that because you want me to steal a bike? And even the guy telling the story said, God, you've gone ghetto on me. <laughs> I like that. You, you've gone ghetto on me. You want me to steal another man's bike? But see, what's not in question there, and this is, this is amazing, he didn't question it was the voice of the Lord. I probably would have. I probably would have thought that can't be God. See, this is what I'm talking about, repenting. But he went ahead and did it. And so the only, he was a brand new Christian, like less than two years, I think. And so... The only way he could work it out in his mind, he went, well, the devil stole my brother's bike. Maybe this is just kind of balancing things out. <laughs> I don't know. But he did it, and he ran over there. He jumped on the bike, pedaled away as fast as he could, and finally when he thought he was far enough where it was safe, he pulled over to get his breath a little bit. And then the Lord said, now peel back the padding on the seat. You know how a bicycle is. It's got a metal seat and padding on it and a cover. The Lord says, peel back the padding in the cover. Because he knew that his father, who had assembled the bike, had engraved the family name on the metal seat. Sure enough, when he peeled back and looked, there was the family name. That was his brother's bike. They had repainted it purple, but it was his brother's bike. Never again would he be able to say, Lord, you're powerless to do anything about it. See, but he, he went, now here's the part where I have to repent. This is the part I was mentioning this morning it's because he said that that it, that incident became his pattern for his whole life now this guy is an evangelist if I told you the name you'd know the name and but I hate to mention names anymore for <laughs> seem like as soon as I mention them the next week they fall but anyway I, this one never will I pray but anyway he said that became his pattern Whatever the Lord said to him, no matter the reasonings, I just would obey it. And if the Lord says, I want you to rent that hall, and we don't have any money to rent that building, well, how do, you, how do we do that? And the Lord would give him instructions just like with the bike. And it would make any sense. It wouldn't seem possible. But he would do it, and it would work. Same with buying buildings over time. See, and so I mentioned this morning, Sue, had, from time to time, we'd be driving home or driving somewhere. And she'd see a nice property for sale, land or whatever. She'd say, well, we ought to buy that. And see, I would always just go, well, that's, 
I, I agree with you. We should buy that. Let's go write a check. No, because we'll go to jail, you know, because we don't have that kind of money. Where I've got to repent is that's just limiting God completely to my natural mind. See, and that's what I'm talking about. I've got to change that because if I'd have, what would have happened on many of those times is said, all right, baby, let's fast and pray until we hear if God wants us to buy that or not. Or she'd probably say that to me. Let's, let's fast and pray. Let's get quiet. If he wants us to really buy that, then he's got a way to buy it that I don't know anything about, but he does. That's what's got to happen now. And it doesn't matter what your calling is, really. I mean, I'm talking about that, and that would have implications for gospel entrepreneurship and who knows what all else. But we've got to come to the place where, number one, we don't... See, this is where he's got to teach me more. Even today, if he told, if, if, I, if I heard an instruction that to me sounded like I'm stealing from B, I don't know that I can obey that. And I don't know how he's going to get me around that, but I'm going to go find out if he can. Does that make any sense to you guys? We've got to come to the place. I know this, for revival. I have obeyed him a little bit. Remember the time he told me to put my finger in that lady's mouth? <laughs> See, um, that was a small thing, really, but it wasn't small at the time. You know, I'm really glad I obeyed him now. But see, that's probably a minor, small thing compared to what he wants us to do. So all I know is, it's a, well, what would you do? Gee, what if, I think exactly what we're doing, the blueprint instructions to spend the time with him, in worship, in the word, in prayer, and fasting, where he can teach us. Because we've got to come to the point. The one thing that I really admired in that story, he didn't doubt that it was God's voice. He knew he was hearing God. We've got to get to that place right there. Noah didn't doubt that he heard God. Abraham didn't doubt that he heard God. Moses didn't doubt that he heard God. Jesus, for sure, didn't doubt that he heard God. But see, Ananias didn't doubt it either. We have got to get to that place where we know it's God and understand that safety, once we understand what he's saying, safety is in obeying, not in disobeying. See, and that comes right up to this, this morning's message. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm trying to wrap it up here. He talked about this coming deception, whatever it is, and he said it's months. It's over the next several months, so we're not there yet. Okay? So it's something still coming. But he said in the surface, it is going to look so right. And it's going to look like the right thing to do. But obeying it is going to take us away from the blueprint. And he's plainly telling us, I don't care what it looks like. I don't care how good it looks. He said it's even going to look like the answer. You stay on the path that I've given you. So if it draws us away from what he has said, we can't do it. We can't do it. Safety is staying right where he's told us to be. And then don't forget that last part, which the emphasis was more than I've ever heard him say before. When things are bad, don't run from this place. Run to this place. And especially when the people are assembled, is the way he was putting it. Hallelujah. All right. So all I know is obedience is the only place of safety. Yes, sir. And now again, this, I think this, I know everybody here pretty well. But listen, if, if you're in a, a long space to repent spell... <laughs> And I'm talking specifically about uh, sin. Could be other areas of disobedience. I've been in a long space of repentance regarding longer fasts. He's been wanting me to do longer fasts for a longer time. <laughs> and I've really drug my feet. You know, 10 days is still my longest fast. And that's not a very long fast around here. And uh, I had this sense that our space to repent is coming to an end because the revival is at the door. So if he's been dealing with you 
Especially if it's sin, you've got to stop that. I mean, that time is over. If you're involved in fornication, marry that girl or, or get away from her. But don't continue living in fornication. Same if you're messing with drugs or alcohol or any of those type of things. That's the first things that's got to go. Okay. But then if there's other things that's not really sin, like in my case, resistance to longer fasts, could be resistance to coming to prayer, could be resistance to other things. There's been great space to repent, but I sense, and I think you're sensing, that time is coming to an end because revival is at the door. And it's time to, to jump in full, completely. So, Father, I'm just praying for all of us, Lord. Father, help us, strengthen us again by your Spirit in the inner man. Father, it's all by your grace. We can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. Thank God for Christ on the inside of us. We are able to do all things. And Father, with each of us, help us search our hearts. And if we find areas where we have not obeyed or only partially obeyed, Lord, help us now to come into full obedience, to just throw caution to the wind and obey you like you're telling us the truth. <laughs> Because that's really the only place of safety. Father, we thank you that you hear this prayer and you will help us. In Jesus' name we pray and you can say, Amen. Well, I totally forgot to bring in my Bible with the confessions, so I'm going to have to bother Darren again. And we'll go through the confessions. And Dave Roberson, if you have some of those. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. So just repeat after me. Say, Father, I worship you. I glorify you. I praise you. You're not a man that you could lie. You have exalted your word above your name. Heaven and earth will pass away. But your word will never pass away. <laughs> Therefore, I say. Your glory is present at the prayer center. The blind see. The deaf hear. The lame walk. The dead are raised. And the poor have the gospel preached to them. A minimum of a thousand people are born again at the prayer center every week. We have a minimum of 500 intercessors who are holding up the message that has come to maturity. We are able to get along with each other while the Father works revival in our midst. We have that kind of worship that takes us beyond the veil of the flesh in order that we may worship in spirit and in truth. We worship you, Father, out of our new nature. We give you family worship as your sons and daughters. Father, at the prayer center, those that come will see a people transformed to the nature of Christ. Father, we say, in the name of Jesus, no person ever leaves the prayer center the same way they came. Every person that comes receives a touch from the Good Shepherd. Father, those that come who are beaten down, discouraged, worn out, and tired, they won't leave that way. They'll be encouraged, strong, and mature. They'll leave standing upright, their shoulders squared, their heads held high, going forth as a mighty army to take this planet for your kingdom. In the name of Jesus, Father, your glory fills every service. Every person that comes drinks of your glory. They'll leave as earthen vessels, 
filled with your glory, filled with your wisdom, filled with your love, filled with your grace, and anointed by your spirit. They'll carry your presence with them, and they'll carry revival around this world. Father, we declare, we preach your gospel. We'll never settle for man's gospel. Only yours. It's the gospel that saves, the gospel that fills, and the gospel that heals. That's why we say, lost, be saved. Empty, be filled. Blind, see. Lame, walk. Deaf, hear. Maimed, be whole. Dead, rise again in the name of Jesus. Father, that's your gospel. We'll settle for nothing less. <laughs> We're going for the gold. We have what we say. And we say at every service, the lost are saved. People are filled with the Holy Ghost. The blind see. The lame walk. The deaf hear. The maimed are made whole. And even the dead are raised. In the name of Jesus. More than 12 legions of angels are loosed to prepare the way for revival. Angels are dispatched to the four corners of the earth, intercepting and stopping every mission and every assignment of the enemy that would bring circumstances against those who would come. Angels are changing those circumstances hmm. by rearranging them, causing money to come, and by changing schedules. We say every person that is to be here will be here in the name of Jesus. There is no devil big enough, no assignment crafty enough, no circumstances bad enough that will keep even one from being here. Father, we declare your house full. Angels are moving back. The forces of darkness over this region. They're opening up a window. A window of light. 25 miles in every direction both horizontally and vertically. There is a fortress of angels surrounding us to keep back the darkness. Father, angels are dispatched now, softening the hearts where hurts have wounded, where calluses have formed, where walls of defenses have gone up. Angels are softening the hearts and creating atmospheres where the people can hear the voice of their shepherd. Angels are preparing their hearts now. So they're already receivers when they arrive. From the first word spoken, from the first song sung, from the first prayer prayed, to the end of every service, the people are free to receive from your spirit. The assignments of all devils against the prayer center, the people of the prayer center, and the leadership of the prayer center, all those assignments are dismissed in the name of Jesus. I declare those plans null and void. Devil, we're taking Tulsa from you. In fact, we already have. Jesus is Lord over Tulsa. 
Not you. We're an authority here. Not you. Devil, get out of Tulsa. Take all your demons with you. The King of Kings has made a decree. And I am speaking in his stead. The King has declared. This is the acceptable year of the Lord. The King has decreed. Captives, you are free. Every person returns to his original inheritance. That is the born again trail. Father, you have restored our inheritance. And at the prayer center, the inheritance is not just known about. We don't just teach about it. But it's received, manifested, and seen. Mm. Father, you have restored our fellowship with you. <coughs> the firstborn told us to pray. Father, your will be done on earth, just as it is in heaven. As in heaven, so on earth. As in heaven, so in Tulsa. There are no lost people in heaven. Therefore, we say, Tulsa is saved. There are no sick people in heaven. Therefore, we say, Tulsa is healed. There are no demoniacs in heaven. Therefore we say, Tulsa is delivered. And there's no poor people in heaven. Therefore we say, Tulsa is prospered. And Tulsa is blessed. We declare every captive free. Now see this with your hoper as we do this now. Every wheelchair emptied, all of them, no exceptions, every artificial help, wheelchairs, crutches, canes, hearing aids, glasses, stretchers, bladder bottles, they may need them when they come, they won't need them when they leave, and we'll have them here as trophies. To the glory of Jesus, the healer. All manner of sickness and all manner of diseases are healed first time, every time. All of them, no exceptions. Jesus, you healed them all then. You heal them all now. That's what we say. That's what we have. In the name of Jesus. Father, there are impartations of your spirit. <laughs> Excuse me. We declare these are the most powerful. The most anointed. The most life changing. The most revival producing. Services in history. Fresh anointings. Fresh giftings. Like never before, since the book of Acts, Father, it's you doing the works. Therefore, all things are possible. So, natural man, natural mind, soul, I command you, believe this, all things are possible. All things are possible. All things are possible. Every backslider will come back to God. They'll never leave God again. So now, Father, in preparation, I forgive every person their trespasses against me. Father, forgive me all of my trespasses against you. I am freshly washed in the blood of the Lamb in order that my record in heaven be perfect. Therefore I say, because of the blood, 
what Jesus did for me. According to my record in heaven, I have never failed God. I lay down my life that the life of Christ may be manifest in me. I take no offense. I give no offense. And according to my record in heaven, I never have. At the prayer center, the mind of Christ is delivered to both the sheep and the shepherds. It is delivered with such simplicity and with such clarity that the wayfaring fool could not misunderstand it. Therefore I say, the people at the prayer center, and especially me, we all understand every word that Pastor Dave teaches. And we declare that Pastor Dave teaches. Every need is met, no matter how large, no matter how small. There are no cases too hard. There are no cases too late. Whatever they come for to receive from Jesus, they get it, all of them, first time, every time, no exceptions. I declare every captive free, free in spirit, free in soul, free in body, all are delivered, all are restored. Father, you are provider. Father, you are provider. Angels are dispatched to gather in all of the finances and everything that is required. Things we know about now, things we don't even know about yet, because you are the God who answers before we call. I speak against the strongholds of lack, and I declare an abundance. Abundance. Be in the name of Jesus. Therefore, we say, there is no lack. We operate from abundance. We operate from surplus. <laughs> we have all in abound with many baskets left over. We have such abundance. We can pay the way for many to come and many to go. And we send them out on prosperous journeys for God with abundance in a manner fitting for servants of the Lord. Our financial granaries are full because our King has found stewards He can trust. Then I'm one of them. Father, if you need anything, come to my house first. Whatever you have need of, come to my house first. Mm -hmm. All I need to know is my Lord has need of it. And it's yours. I've been bought with a price. My life is not my own. I am a first class servant. Lord, I lay all my possessions at your feet. And I say again, Lord, if you need anything I have, it's yours. I love you, Lord, with all of my heart, all of my soul, all of my mind, and all of my strength. The second commandment is like unto the first. I love my neighbor as myself. I love my good neighbors. I love my bad neighbors. I love my mean neighbors. And I love my enemies. Jesus, you are my Savior. You are my Lord. Whatever you ask, that's what I do. I am your servant. I am your bond slave. 
by my own free will choice. I serve you, Lord, by serving these people that you love so much. <laughs> I serve the good people. I serve the bad people. I serve the mean people. And I especially serve your enemies. Because you're trying to save them all. And you'd like to use me to do it. All that I have is yours. Jesus, you are my Savior. You are my Lord. Whatever you ask, that's what I do. I am your servant. I am your bond slave by my own free will choice. By the way, he took me back this week to a teaching I haven't done in many years. Many of you will remember it. But you remember the bond slaves that, you know, the time had come they could be released. It's the year of Jubilee. And they could, they're free to go if they want to, but they love their master. And they said, no, me and my family, we're going to stay of our own free choice, free will choice, because you've been good to us. You take good care of us. So what they would do, they would take them to the doorpost of the master's house. You all remember this teaching? And they would take an awl, A-W-L, which is like an ice pick, and they would pierce the fatty lobe of the ear right into the doorpost of the master's house. What is that a picture of? If you're going to be my bond servant, you need to listen at my doorpost all the time. Boy, if that's not where he's called us right now, to listen at the doorposts of the master, to have our ear attuned to him all the time. Because we are his bond slaves by our own free will choice. He's been taking me back to that. It's a good teaching. I serve you, Lord, <laughs> by serving these people that you love so much. I serve the good people. I serve the bad people. I serve the mean people. And I especially serve your enemies. Because you're trying to save them all. And you'd like to use me to do it. All that I have is yours. My time is yours. My body is yours. My family is yours. I own nothing. I am your bond slave. Use me as you will. You are provider for me. My family and all that I have. And I am available for your use. We lift up the blood-stained banner over this city. Written in the blood of Jesus on the banner are these words. Jesus is Lord over Tulsa. Jesus is Lord over Tulsa. Tulsa is in revival. Tulsa is in revival. Where Jesus is Lord, the Father's will is done. Father, have your way. Not just 30 foe, not just 60 foe, but 100 foe. Again, I say, lost, be saved. Empty, be filled. Captives, go free. Blind, see. Deaf, hear. Lame, walk. Maimed, be whole. Dead, rise again. In the name of Jesus. Father, thine is the kingdom. Thine is the power. Thine is the glory. Forever, your will be done in Tulsa. Just as it is in heaven. As in heaven, so in earth. As in heaven, so in Tulsa. Tulsa is saved. Tulsa is saved. Tulsa is saved. Now shout about it. Hallelujah. Glory, glory, glory. We have what we say. We have what we say. In the name of Jesus, we have what we say. Amen, amen, amen. All right, I'm not, I'm not going to lift the box up here, but Father, we're praying for our possible box. We, it's the possible box now. In fact, it's the place called Dunn Box. We put all those people in the place called Dunn. 
Father, we're not praying again like you didn't hear us the first time. We know you heard us the first time. And our job is to believe that we receive when we pray. And Lord, you said if we would do that, we shall have it, Lord. So we shall see the miracle, the miraculous supernatural healing, and the miracles performed on each and every one of those people in Jesus' name. Father, regarding the prayer requests inside the box that come in daily, Lord, your word declares that if we ask anything that's according to your will, we know that you hear us. Lord, our confidence is if you hear us, then we have the petition that we desire of you. So we're just adding our faith to those that mailed in the request, Lord, and we're thanking you for answering every prayer that Jesus paid the price for them to have. And Father, if a, if a stranger sent a prayer request in, a stranger meaning they're not in the kingdom, they're not born again, they could be atheist, agnostic, Hindu, Buddhist, Muslim, or anything else, but if they had enough faith to send a prayer request here, and if that request is in line with your will, Father, we ask like Solomon asked, answer the prayer of the stranger. But Father, do it in such a unique and unusual way. They will have to know that it's you that answered that prayer so they can know like we already know that you are the only true and living God. And they can hear the gospel of your son and be saved, Lord. Father, we do pray for every prayer cloth that goes forward from this house and from all of the uh, fellowships associated with this message. Father, you haven't changed at all. You're the same God today that you were in the book of Acts, and that's why we expect the same results. When those claws are laid on the sick, they will recover. When they're laid on those that have devils, those devils will come out. Father, that means all kinds of alcoholism, drug addiction, bipolar, mental diseases of all kinds, Lord. They'll be instantly set free. Marriages will be put back together. Wayward children will come to their senses and return home. And many other such things you do. Because you haven't changed. And you're the same God today that you were then. And we thank you for it, Father, in Jesus' name. We do lift up Tim and Leah Stemple. All of their house. Dave and Rosalie Roberson. All of their house, Lord. Lord, all of the ministers and their families, not only here at the prayer center, but in every fellowship that has associated itself with this one, with the message that has come to maturity. Lord, we declare no weapon formed against them will prosper, but everything they set their hand to do will prosper. And that includes the ministers, the churches, the staff, the volunteers, their cars, their dogs, their cats, everything, Lord. Nothing, no weapon formed against them will prosper. No more car wrecks. We bind car wrecks in Jesus' name. We thank you, Lord, for safety and angels preparing the way when we drive. Amen. We thank you for it, Father, in Jesus' name. And we thank you for speedy recovery and replacement of vehicles. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Father, last but not least, we are faced now with another week. We're in the holiday season, but this week is pretty tame. Lord, give us wisdom that we don't waste the hours that you've given us. Someday we are going to stand before you and give an accounting of how we stewarded this life you gave us. Lord, we don't want, to be a, we don't want it to be on frivolous things. We don't want to be able to stand there with the Apostle Paul and say, we fought the good fight, we kept the faith, and we finished the race that you set in front of us. Father, for us, we know what that race is. It is revival. And you will have your revival. Let's just declare a few things over Pastor Dave. I don't have a sheet in front of me tonight. But Father Dave has a sound mind. Full of wisdom. And power. No fear at all. Lord you are the strength of his life. Dave's youth is renewed like the eagles. Dave is able to articulate clearly. All the days of his life. He speaks to his soul every day. And we join him right now saying. You are not permitted to lose memories. Never. In Jesus name. Dave Roberson is a steward of the mysteries of God. And he remembers every. Every. Uh, uh, <laughs> every revelation, thank you. He remembers every, I remember every revelation. <laughs> okay, start again. Dave is a steward of the, 
mysteries of God. <laughs> and he remembers every revelation he has ever received. Devil, you're a liar. Dave is leading the charge into the revival. The revival of soundness of mind and sanity. A revival so grounded in truth that even the world will have to say, Your God must be God. Father, that is the truth. And Dave Roberson is leading the charge. Hallelujah.